I wanted to just kind of summarize some of what we've been heard today about, uh, and one of the themes throughout the day has been, you know, disaggregating, um, mostly about services and technology and IT monoliths and, and uh, disaggregating them into smaller services, and then also about how the organizational structure uh, needs to mimic that. A lot of what Asanka was talking about is how we also make smaller teams that can be uh, more self-guided and, and manage their own domains more independently and how that br gives you uh, agility. And I want to kind of extend that a little bit uh, into how you now uh, work with vendors in a more disaggregated way. And so this is where I, I slip in a little bit of WSO2 pitch as well and how we can help uh, become part of your trusted uh, ecosystem of expertise and uh, technology and advice and resources to help you reach your uh, goals with the lowest cost and the most agility and the most reliability. So as, I, as you know, I said, we've been talking about uh, you know, technology disaggregation and the th areas we focus on are APIs, integration, and identity. But when you're talking about working with uh, another organization and teaming up with uh, somebody like WSO2, um, there are also factors that help make that a very productive uh, relationship. Um, and some of them are the transparency that you have on your, on your IP and the open source licensing that you provide, uh, making sure you're clear on how you govern your, uh, the evolution of that technology, and also you know, how you operate and make sure that you know, the character of the organization you're working with it also supports your goals in your organization. And all those really help nurture a broad ecosystem of, of, uh, of talent, not only uh, you know, technology from us, for, but technology from our partners like you know, Ping Intelligence with their AI can really help uh, out some of our customers, or with the talent like Yenlo brings a huge amount, uh, you know, just decades of experience with successful projects to, into this ecosystem to help us all together uh, solve the problems that you're facing. So I'm going to go through a few of these items in a little more detail, just a little bit of a refresher and to, to reinforce how important openness is. I can't really say it better than Miko did this morning, you know, how open, is, open eats uh, closed and there's tons of, of pressure. We continue to drive that wave. Um, if you look under open source, uh, there are actually kind of two basic c categories of licenses that are used. One is called copyleft. That's very uh, popular. Uh, it's what Linux is under, for instance. There's another set which is called permissive. Uh, the copyleft is a great license for protecting your contributions because other people who build on it and then want to distribute that also need to um, make their uh, improvements open. It's, it's a really great way to ensure that your community has access to all of the improvements that are made. Some businesses don't like that much because they like to take something open and then uh, keep a bit of proprietary value on it. I think we're seeing uh, the domination now of the permissive licenses like Apache, which say, this is open source, you can take it, you can resell it, you can build on it. You, the uh, restrictions that you adopt by using the Apache license are very modest, like maintain attribution of where this code came from. So we use o uh, Apache license everywhere. Um, another kind of, I'll say a trick, uh, that some open source companies uh, use is they will provide open source as kind of a community version. It really helps get the word out. But when it comes time to run this in a mission critical uh, scenario in your enterprise, they say, oh, you know what? You really need our enterprise version. Um, you, and that's not under an open source license. And that it makes it much easier to develop a, a business model for that vendor, but it does uh, make it difficult for the users who are adopting the, the, uh, the technology, because all of a sudden, where do they go? All of a sudden, they're out of the community version. They have to start all over with the inter enterprise version. So we don't, we don't uh, do that as well. And this is, you know, one of the things I wanted to share is how we're building our business. And it's, you know, building a business where we spend, you know, hundreds of engineers uh, effort every day to build great products and then give it away open source. How do we actually build a business ar around that? 
Um, but we really do believe openness is the way to get our technology out there to, to, to make sure that uh, it evolves quickly. Um, it gives you as a user the f freedom. If you want to try us out, you just go get it. You don't have to get a license. You don't have to click through terms or anything like that. You can just go and try it out instantly. Um, you don't have to get your legal department involved to say, hey, can, is this trial license okay? Um, you just go and get it. Um, you can, uh, when we're developing the product, I think time and time again, uh, the industry has proved that open development is faster. You get more people from a more diverse uh, community working on code and the, st the speed of innovation of that community can outstrip a closed community where there's less transparency and a less diverse community of developers. Um, the community also helps make sure that the technology satisfies a broad range of, of uh, use cases. So, you know, if you have a diverse community, your software needs the right extension points and the right features in order to appeal to many, many people. And um, it, uh, the open source model we adopt, this isn't built into the license, but we also adopt a, lot, a model for open source governance where uh, we all participate in where the code is going. You know, we, of course, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about our product roadmap, but we also work with a lot of customers. We also work with a community and people on our mailing list you know, to validate those decisions, to learn from them, to inform our expertise uh, and, and get it out there. So all of our customers have participated in informing the roadmap for where our open source projects and the products based on them go. Um, so just to dive a little bit more into the governance, this is not, again, it's, this is a separate question from open source licensing than is how do you actually manage uh, uh, an open source project. And we've adopted uh, from the early, from the start of WSO2, the Apache way, which is used in the Apache Software Foundation where some of our uh, initial technology uh, was hosted. You know, we contributed there, we worked a lot in Apache. And it's a community of individuals, it's not a, a community of corporations. And we continue to, uh, to act in that way. So if you look at our uh, open source code bases, there are, uh, it's governed through discussion and through the committers. The committers are the individuals who have demonstrated their, their worth to the community. And those often are WSO2 employees. They're not automatically WSO2 employees, but it's also external uh, people. And when you join a community, for instance, you make some code improvements, you can't commit those. A yeah, committer is a, changing the open source code base needs to go through the government's project uh, process. But you can propose them, committers will review them, and as you, you build your reputation for making valuable contributions, eventually uh, the other committers can vote you in as a committer. So this is open to all of our customers, users uh, around the world. Um, and it also helps us ensure that you know, the contributions uh, meet the license requirements that, that we uh, require for the intellectual property that's committed. So a valuable part of, of what goes into uh, WSO2's development cycle. I'm going to show a little bit more about, you know, actually uh, it's hard to build uh, good software, but maybe it's even harder to build a business model uh, around giving that software away for free. And that's kind of what I'm in charge of, <laughs> is making sure our licensing model, our pricing, our services and subscription products continue to evolve to better meet the needs of, of the users. And so I'll give you a little overview about how we do that and what it means for the relationship that our users and customers have with WSO2. So again, we, uh, we use the uh, Apache uh, 2.0 uh, license for all of our products. And um, uh, for our documentation, we use the com Creative Commons 4.0, which is very similar to Apache, which is it's essentially an attribution license. You can take our documentation, you can republish it, you can re mix it up, you can mash it up. Uh, please keep an attribution of where that originally came from. And that not only benefits us, but it benefits your consumers too to know what the source and provenance of this uh, content was. And of course, for samples and our training labs and all of the other associated uh, like executables that go along with our products, those are all under the Apache license. We uh, ship updates to subscribers, those updates are actually under what we call the WSO2 update EULA. That's not an open source license. 
Uh, that's uh, the, uh, it's, it's a commercial term license. Um, it helps, it represents uh, an interaction that's, that's kind of a one-on-one -on -one, uh, interaction between us and, and you. It just helps us um, ensure that the effort we put into our updates, uh, which are driven by our customers, are kind of stay with between us and the customers. So we have uh, been pretty successful at, at this model. Um, uh, and it's driven by a, a few things. Here's three of, of the top ones. One is that we continue to try and find value beyond just simply the products. You can download our products. Hopefully, they provide uh, value uh, to you. But also, there's a lot more that goes on uh, in the value proposition that we can offer than just the products. And that, a lot of that comes through expertise and our ability to have a relationship uh, with you to bring that expertise to your, uh, to your um, um, uh, organization. Another is simply economies of scale. You know, if we, uh, there are some services that we can provide around our code that are fairly expensive for an individual user to provide, but if we can share the cost of those between all users, like uh, WSO2 update, how do we, uh, you know, if, how do we take a bug, get it fixed, get it back out to you? Well, we can share the cost of that that whole organization and process among many customers and provide a lower cost for every individual customer. So we can leverage the economies of scale inherent in the WSO2 customer and user com community to save you money while funding our R&D. And then it's one of the things that uh, I can't discount is, you know, WSO2, in order to build a business like this, where we give away the, the, the software for free, we have to be very efficient in our uh, development, in our uh, marketing, in our uh, sales process. We really rely on a lot of content-based marketing. You don't see us uh, doing lots of Google advertisements. We rely on word of mouth. We rely on inbound leads from people who've tried the product and contact us instead of hiring expensive uh, enterprise salespeople that go out and knock on your door and, and see what you want. So. Um, I think one of the keys to our success with this model is we have been able to find ways to make it a very efficient business and, f and uh, be able to take uh, reasonably priced services and funnel it back into our R&D. The way we think about our commercial model is kind of a one-to-n or one-to-one -one relationship. So we have our open source products and things we can do that we can do once and benefit lots and lots of, of uh, users like post a product for download. Everybody can come and get that. It costs us nothing to add another user there. That's something that scales very well. We can do that. Uh, when a c we work individually with a user or with a customer, that's a very expensive interaction because for e every time we have a new customer, we have to work with them. Those are the things that we commercialize. So you can kind of break down what WSO2 does by is it a one-to-n relationship, in which case we can make it free, or is it a one-to-one -one relationship, in which case we have to uh, commercialize it. We still, uh, of course, uh, pride ourselves in having a complete open source enterprise quality track um, where you, it's self-service. You go, you download the product. Um, you can get uh, upgrades. So if you need a bug fix or new features, you, there's a new release periodically. You can upgrade uh, to that. Um, it's governed by the Apache way, so you can you can uh, just go to our open mailing lists and help uh, you know choose which features. We have uh, uh, kind of community support through Stack Overflow. We participate there. Many of our other users participate there. We have a support bot which which scrapes a lot of information, internal documentation, uh, uh, knowledge bases and stuff to try and provide uh, automated uh, uh, support for uh, common questions. That's something, of course, that we can do for many people uh, instead of on a one-to-one. -one. We do also provide security updates just on the latest version of, of our software out publicly. So we do have a way to make sure all of our users are uh, have the latest security updates, and things like self-paced online training are available. So this is a, a viable way to adopt WSO2 technology. However, um, we can do more under our WSO2 subscription 
uh, uh, service. So the first thing we do is we uh, assign an account team to help answer your questions. Every account team has a technical owner. Uh, you know, Mifon uh, leads our uh, solution architecture team. Most of the technical owners come from him. So we can uh, discuss your architecture. We can have regular checkpoints. There's lots of, uh, of, of value in you know, building a relationship where we can share some of the insights we've gotten uh, from other customers and in our experience in the industry and try and apply it to your particular case. We give you access to WSO2 Update. Uh, it's like Windows Update where you can subscribe to a series of bug fixes and security fixes and performance improvements and, and things like that. Uh, we offer a 10-year lifetime of service. for um, One of the costs for the community uh, version is, yes, you can always get the latest features and the latest uh, security updates, the latest uh, bug fixes, but you have to migrate to the latest version. Uh, with WSO2 Update, essentially, we, we have a way to deliver you bug fixes into your existing version, and we will continue to support that and monitor its, its you know, security and, and so forth for up to 10 years. So uh, that can really save your migration uh, e effort uh, quite a bit. And that's one reason why the update service is for our uh, com commercial uh, customers. Uh, of course, we have a private channel for support instead of going to Stack Overflow and saying, hey, you know, I have an issue that might be embarrassing uh, for you. But we have a private JIRA where we can work with you uh, on our 24-7 uh, global SLA so you know we're going to be there when you have an issue. Uh, there's a huge amount of value in what we do on an ongoing basis around security. We have a, a security team that's constantly uh, you know, monitoring uh, both incoming uh, reports of security violations, uh, in, uh, reports of security violations on other technologies. You know, we, we did a lot of work to check if the Intel chip um, uh, vulnerability that came out, uh, was disclosed last year, had any impact on uh, WSO2. Um, we run lots of code uh, analysis tools on our code bases all the time, and we even, uh, lately, the EU has sponsored a bug bounty on us. So we're constantly looking and monitoring to make sure that the code that you have uh, is as secure as, as we can tell. Uh, if, if you're a subscriber, we also will give you a uh, security bulletin in advance uh, so that you have an oper and a uh, security uh, patch, security update, in advance of making any of the vulnerability public so you have a chance to uh, uh, patch your systems before it goes out to the whole, whole community. And then we have additional services on, on top of that with uh, you, you know, hosting uh, your, uh, your system. And we can manage it in your cloud. Uh, or we have a public cloud uh, that we run ourselves. So we can take some of the operational and hosting uh, costs off of, off of uh, your team. And since we share that cost on a 24-7 basis and we have well-developed best practices shared ac across many customers, our managed cloud offering and our public cloud offering can really uh, save you a lot of, of money. And we have many other consulting services around uh, you know, quick starts, training, implementation services, integration, agile consultancy that Asanka is putting together, security workshops that Praboff puts together, and so forth. So the the value proposition that we put out of the subscription is, you know, it rests on the underlying uh, technical value of the products. On top of that, our expertise, our an ongoing relationship with us, our access to, uh, you know, specific. Uh, uh, consulting services and the investment we made in, in and the uh, generosity of our partners in joining the ecosystem to help bring WCO2 skills uh, to you. Risk reduction, you know, so we're monitoring security for you. If there isn't uh, a, a bug fix or something, we can get that to you in rapid time. We're standing by 24-7 uh, for you to uh, make sure that if you do have any production issue, that we're there. And if, if you're running WSO2 in a mission critical capacity, you know, these are incredibly valuable uh, services uh, to provide. And, you know, the, there's nobody better place to bring an incredible amount of expertise to a WSO2 problem than, you know, our engineering team, our support team, our solution architecture team to find out, 
you know, what's going on, how we can, uh, how we can bring that to you. So um, that's really driven our business is because WSO2 is used in so many mission critical situations. You'd be kind of crazy not to, uh, not to uh, reduce your risk by uh, leveraging, you know, our, our existing uh, uh, operational and expertise services to do that. Again, uh, upgrade life cycle control, I think is very valuable for some people. You know, you may decide to upgrade only every two years instead of every, you know, six months when a new release comes out and you can still get all of the bug fixes you might need, security updates and, and so forth. And then, uh, you know, again, op operations, we can outsource some of that for you, can save a lot of effort uh, and leverage our best practices on monitoring, 24-7 monitoring, uh, disaster recovery, uh, all those kinds of things. So, you know, I think the idea is we don't just kind of hand uh, technology over the portal and say, here you go, you know, have fun with it. But our business is around how can we work with you to help you solve your problems Working with you helps make our products better because we learn what challenges you're, you're facing. You can see Paul Asanka uh, have, have interacted with just hundreds of organizations to find out what are the real uh, challenges facing you, how can we align our products with that, and how can we all pull together uh, to, uh, to solve those problems. And you know, we're, our belief is that openness is really critical to that, and that's why we're so committed to open source and open governance and, and having a really trusted uh, relationship with you. So I wanna thank you all for coming today. It's been a, a long day. There's been a, a lot of really great uh, content uh, here. Um, and um, I really hope that uh, for those of you who are WC2 customers, thank you and, uh, for coming. I hope this has been valuable. For those of you who are considering WC2, you know, I, uh, we're here. We'd love to, to talk with you and uh, see if we can help, uh, help you uh, win the race as well.